Welcome to this online gathering. I'm Margaret Maiman, Minister of St Michael's Uniting Church in Melbourne. Wherever you've come from, wherever you're going to, whatever you believe, whatever you do not believe, you are welcome. We begin our gathering acknowledging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who have dwelled with this land since time before dreaming. At St Michael's, we acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation on whose land this church was built. We acknowledge that land was taken from Indigenous people without their consent, treaty or compensation. We honour the elders of the Wurundjeri people, past, present and emerging, and join with them in hope for justice for people and for the land. I invite you to acknowledge the Indigenous people on whose land you live. A warm welcome to you, St Michael's members and friends, and to you, our online gathered community, and especially to any of you who are joining us for the first time today. At St Michael's online gathering, we are connecting, feeding our spirits in these challenging times. We come recognising the stress in our corporate and individual lives. We come acknowledging that some are experiencing suffering. We bring the spiritual tradition of Christian faith, the wisdom of other paths, the insights of poets, and the glories of music into dialogue with the realities of our lives, seeking solace and beauty, so that in the company of the sacred and each other, we may live well, not just for ourselves, but for our social and ecological worlds. In the spirit of God, who shares divinity with us, in the spirit of God, who shares humanity with us, in the spirit of God who unsettles and inspires us, let us celebrate life in its beauty and its blessed diversity. The sacred made known by many names, made known in many ways, let us sing together God the All Holy. prayer of awareness. Let us gather now, friends of spirit, travellers in time, to hear the story of love's evolving narrative. In this sacred time, we release into the present, 
laying aside all worries, plans, and complaints, entering into the now of mystery's eternal temple. In this sacred time, we honor our past, retelling the great story of deep time as spirit's unfolding tale, giving thanks that a whole universe is gathered up in the likes of us, tradition's promise. In this sacred time, we consent to the allurement of an unrehearsed future from where the living word woos each one of us toward our unique expression that is the spirit's dream. And remembering Jesus who invites us on this way, we pray together. Spirit of the universe, we respect and cherish your creativity. We long to live according to your ways, choosing and doing what is just and right. Sustain our physical and spiritual needs. In acknowledging our own perfections, we accept the frailty of others. We seek to make good choices through your wisdom made known through the generations and your eternal presence with all creation. Amen. We share a sign of peace with one another. I invite you to share peace with those in your household, your community, your city and our world. We are alive, we are loved. We are free to share life and love in the world. May the peace of divine presence be with you. Amen. Hear words of faith in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. Then Peter came and asked Jesus, when a sister or brother wrongs me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? No, Jesus replied, not seven times, but I tell you, 70 times seven. And this is why. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a ruler who wished to settle accounts with his officials. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, the ruler ordered him to be sold, together with his family and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the official fell down in homage before the ruler, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything and moved to compassion for him. The ruler let the official go and forgave him the debt. But that same official, as he went out, came upon one of a colleague who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then that same official, fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But the official refused. Then he went and threw him in prison until the debt was paid. When the other officials saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to the ruler all that had taken place. Then the ruler summoned the official and said to him, You wicked wretch, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow official as I had mercy on you? And in anger, the ruler handed the official over to be tortured until he should pay the entire debt. So my Abba God in heaven will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your sisters and your brothers from your hearts. For 
for the stories of Jesus and the beloved community. We give thanks. Contemporary Words of Spirit in a poem by Yehuda Amachai titled The Place Where We Are Right. From the place where we are right, flowers will never grow in the spring. The place where we are right is hard and trampled like a yard. But doubts and loves Dig up the world like a mole, a plough, and a whisper will be heard in the place where the ruined house once stood. For the spirit speaking still, we give thanks. In the name of the spirit, calling us, connecting us, changing us. From the place we are right, flowers will never grow in spring. The place we are right is hard and trampled like a yard. But doubts and loves dig up the world like a mole, a plough. And a whisper will be heard in the place where the ruined house once stood. Reflecting on Matthew's parable with its emphasis on extravagant, unearned forgiveness, I came across this poem by Israeli poet Yehuda Amakai. Being right, feeling right, believing I'm right, makes the forgiveness and the reconciliation that Jesus taught much more difficult. As short and simple as the poem is, it helps me remember that nothing new can grow in people, people in disagreement or conflict, when we speak to each other from the place that is right. I know that this is true for me on a personal level. My default position in a situation of disagreement is to frame the division between myself and the other as a debate. If I can just convince the other person that my well-constructed argument is correct, then my rational brain concludes they will understand that I am right and all will be well. The emotional intelligence that I've had to work much harder to cultivate in life knows that being right is not the place from which relationship is restored. The place where I am right hardens the ground where something new might emerge, resisting the plough or the nighttime activity of the mole or the bandicoot, activity that would churn up the ground and in the morning let in the air and the sunlight that enables new growth to flourish. In our COVID context in Melbourne, the gloves are off now. The roadmap, return to normal, even COVID normal, has been met with resignation by some and rage by others. Blame and anger abound, 
And I know from conversations with St. Michael's people that many find the culture of noisy blaming is making a hard situation harder to bear. Even those who, of us who are resigned to three more weeks of level four lockdown are raging sometimes, angry and defeated by others who blame and criticize, who apparently want what we want, which is both public safety and economic sustainability, but who are debating from different premises. The poem doesn't just speak to our interpersonal antagonisms, but to our broader social divisions. I wonder how we could move ourselves and our society from the rehearsal of all the good reasons why we are right to another place where we remember that it is hopefully, usually, concern for the common good that binds us together. How might things change if we begin our political conversations not from our certainties, but from our doubts and from our loves? The doubts and loves that might dig up the world, our communities, our churches, and our own lives, and allow something new to emerge from where the ruined house once stood. If we placed ourselves on this open, common ground, where something new waits to be built, we might recognize that many of us who differ politically love the same things, a future for our children, our faith, our country, the natural world. And might we also recognize that many of us who differ politically share the same doubts. We doubt that what's currently been done or not done to care for the people and things we love is the best thing or the right thing to do. We differ on what should be done, on how to do it. Yuda Amakai invites us to consider an alternative to debating solutions where we start from the place that is right. His poem instead asks us to engage with those with whom we disagree, to share our loves and our doubts. In the context of COVID, there are fears that are real and deep. We wonder if we will ever again walk beyond the borders of our homes without worrying that we might touch something or breathe an air that harbors a virus, a virus that could make us or someone we love terribly ill. We worry that our city, one of the world's most vibrant, livable, diverse cities, will ever recover from having the cultural and economic life sucked out of it. Many fear the economic impact of this change as they face the prospect of joblessness and poverty, possibly even homelessness. We fear for the elderly whose lives are openly being considered expendable we fear for the children missing school and social experiences that are necessary for the formation of character. And our fears so easily translate into anger. I'm a little ashamed to confess that mine come out while watching the news, that I have been recently responding, shut up, politician who will not be named, to the TV. I'm not proud of myself, but here we are. A New Zealand minister, a friend of mine, Glyn Cardi, whom some of you will have met through Common Dreams conferences, recently shared on Facebook an example of an alternative politics, an alternative to yelling at the television and everything else we're experiencing. He spoke of a parliamentary speech made by opposition MP, Dr. Shane Retty. Dr. Retty is a member of the New Zealand National Party, which broadly shares the political philosophy of the Liberal and National Coalition in Australia. He's the opposition spokesperson for health. Speaking of the recent return to lockdown following a COVID outbreak in Auckland, which seems to have been spread from, wait for it, quarantine hotels, Dr. Retty said, sometimes in situations like this, with huge complexity and many balls in the air, one of them gets dropped. When that happens, this opposition will help pick up that ball and put it back in its correct place. There will be a time to understand how the ball was dropped, but first we will help to put it back, and then we will figure out how not to drop it again. Many of us yearn for a politics shaped by this openness. We yearn for life in our families, our communities, our cities and churches, where we can let go of our rightness 
and remember what we and those with whom we disagree actually love, when we can let go of being right. As writer Anne Lamott says, you can either practice being right or practice being kind. Kindness and compassion bring me to forgiveness and the teaching of Jesus as understood by the writer of Matthew's Gospel. The teaching about not placing a limit on forgiveness is undoubtedly an authentic teaching of Jesus. The parable of the unforgiving servant or official is only found in Matthew's Gospel and likely to be a product of his community. Jesus' authentic parables tended to be a bit more subtle and less moralistic than this one. This parable of Jesus, this parable does have some touches of Jesus though, in, for example, the use of hyperbole as a literary device. We don't need to get stuck on the rather repulsive image of God as one who would order torture for those who failed to meet the mark of generous forgiveness. In the oral tradition, teachers like Jesus made their stories memorable for their hearers. So there seem to be several places in Matthew's Gospel where Matthew's fears in relation to the persecution of his community led him to emphasize violent punishment in ways that are inconsistent with Jesus' teaching about God's love and forgiveness. And unfortunately, the very memorable nature of those claims about eternal darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth have meant that modern people have received a distorted view of a punishing God. This view is um, embraced by some Christians who seem to delight in imagining their enemies in eternal torment. Or it's rejected by other modern people who want nothing to do with this kind of angry religion. A progressive Christian perspective enables us to reject that which is not life-giving in order that the wisdom of the story might still be available to us. It enables us to reject an understanding of forgiveness that focuses on the forgiveness of sins in order to embrace a gospel which is about making people and communities whole. Reduction of God's forgiveness to a cosmic transaction in which his son pays off his debtor's debts, in which God becomes a dealer who does not have the generosity to forgive, but is determined to get paid one way or another, is not a view of the sacred that we are required to accept, to accept as authentic to Jesus or authoritative for our lives. There is also hyperbole in the amount of debt owed by the first official relative to the debt that was owed to him. There are different opinions among scholars on the value of talents and denarii. One scholar suggests that in our terms, the first debt would be about $10 million and the second about $100. Even if the parable isn't directly authentic to Jesus, and even if it suggests a view of God that we reject, this doesn't mean that it's of no use to us. It can challenge us, challenge us even now to live a life of love, marked by forgiveness that does not keep a score. The Australian New Testament scholar Bill Loder has written, the image of debt is helpful in considering the meaning of forgiveness. When someone is in our debt, we have power over them. To forgive is to give up power. Forgiving is a form of giving. We no longer hold something back in our relationship with the other. Holding back is destructive for ourselves and for others. However, it does need to be said that living in a forgiving way has its complexities. We need to be aware of the way that teaching about forgiveness has been used in damaging ways in relation to abuse and to other forms of oppression. Reading accounts of survivors of clerical sexual abuse and of Christian women who've experienced domestic violence this has made me very wary of the ways that forgiveness is used as a weapon in the church to fend off questions about power, justice, repentance and lament. People with power, even bystanders, have no right 
to demand that an abused or oppressed person forgives. People forgive or not according to their own timetable. Recently, I saw this watching the video of survivors of the Christchurch white supremacist mosque murders. For some, the anger, the loss, the lament, the visceral memories of being hunted down in their sacred space meant that their anger and grief spilled out into the courtroom. Let it take as long as it takes. Forgiveness is a process a messy, non-linear process, which in one moment can feel whole and liberating, and in the next moment we are back in the grip of our pain. Saying, I forgive you, doesn't exempt us from this. And no one who struggles to forgive for reasons of temperament or trauma should feel that they are less spiritual because of the struggle. Forgiveness is relational, too often, though, it is reduced to saying sorry without restoration, without reconciliation. Forgiveness is hard work. Again from Bill Loder. Forgiveness disturbs the established values. He says, just look at the outcry it has created in Australia over reconciliation with Aboriginal people. People are afraid to be forgiven. Corporate guilt is so much more difficult to deal with because we cannot quantify responsibility. We are afraid of losing control. Forgiveness and being forgiven is about letting go of control, accepting that some debts can never really be squared. Grace given and grace received will be the basis for reconciliation. And this brings me to another significant point. Forgiveness on the part of the one who has been wronged does not always depend on repentance. For some survivors at the sentencing of the mosque killer, forgiveness was offered in a way that was clearly what the one who was doing the forgiving needed to do in response to their Muslim faith and for their own healing. Because in that context, there had been no remorse or repentance Nothing on the part of this man who had killed 51 people, ranging in age from 77 to three years old, along with dozens more left with lifelong injuries. In our own lives, in less dramatic ways, forgiveness is choosing to prioritise love over resentment. We are human, we fail. We need to be forgiven as much as we need to forgive. If I'm consumed with my own pain, if I've made injury my identity, if I insist on weaponizing my well-deserved anger in every interaction that I have with the people who hurt me, then the damage to my being will be greater than the damage that I do to them. To choose forgiveness, is to release myself from the spiral of bitterness. And there is a spiritual component to this, and that's a seen in understanding the process in terms of our relationship with the sacred, with the divine presence. God knows our hurt and holds it. The sacred knows our yearning for vindication and for justice. To the power of life and love at the heart of the universe, we can entrust our hurt. We can entrust our longing for justice. This process of handing over pain to the accompanying spirit is what it takes for us to sit with our emotions and change the hate and the othering into love. I can't imagine what that would be like in relation to someone who had killed a person that I loved. I do know what it is like to transform the smaller hurts I experience in melting my hard heart and my injured spirit and letting that flow into love 
that enables me to see the humanity of the other. In conclusion, I want to return to the sentencing of Brenton Tarrant in Christchurch. The sentencing of a man who had sought to break a people he did not know or understand. That sentencing brought him into their presence. Nothing on earth could justify what led him and the survivors to that place. But in it, the power of forgiveness was seen. Jana Izat, whose son Hussein al Amari was murdered at the Al Nur Mosque, told the gunman she forgave him. Speaking directly to this man who had killed her son and terrorized her community and the nation, she said, I decided to forgive you, Mr. Tarrant, because I don't have hate, I don't have revenge. In our Muslim faith, we say, we are able to forgive, forgive. I forgive you. Damage was done and Hussein will never be here. So I only have one choice, to forgive you. Brenton Tarrant nodded, nodded in acknowledgement of her words, blinking profusely before wiping his eyes. It was his only show of emotion during the day. No one can require forgiveness. At any given moment, there is no shame in not being able to offer it. But undoubtedly, forgiveness has the power to heal our communities our politics, to heal both the heart of the one who forgives and the spirit of the one who is forgiven. May the spirit give us the courage to risk forgiveness. Amen. Our prayers of thanksgiving and solidarity for justice, compassion and peace. Divine Presence, may forgiveness become a strong current in the living waters that flow through us. May we reach deep inside ourselves to set aside ego, hurt, anger, pride and history, all that is of lesser value, to find the strength to offer hand or voice or presence in reconciliation for a second or a seventh or a 77th time. We pray that a spirit of forgiveness and generosity be present in public life, in our city, state, and nation. We hold in our hearts all who are suffering, the lost and the lonely, the dying and the grieving, people struggling to find mental and spiritual well-being. We pray for our neighbours who are overwhelmed by isolation, for parents supporting their children to study at home, for the parents of little children balancing, working and caring. We proclaim the inherent value of each person no matter their age, resisting with our hearts and our voices anything that diminishes the responsibility we owe to love and protect our elders. We pray for older people who are not seeking the help they need because of fear about aged care, and for family members who are trying to provide care without adequate support. We remember all who are sick with COVID-19 and all who are living with other serious illnesses at a time when seeking health care is infinitely more complex than it usually is. We pray for relief from pain and hope for healing and for the assurance of love. With thankful hearts, we remember doctors and nurses, aged care workers, chaplains, all who are caring for people who are ill and for people who are vulnerable. We pray for epidemiologists and scientific researchers as they explore courses of treatment and prevention. And with concern, we remember everyone impacted by the economic consequences of the pandemic, 
those dependent on job seeker and job keeper benefits, small business owners, artists and musicians, university teachers, temporary visa workers, and international students. And we pray for ourselves as we seek to know peace and share peace, that we may live deeply present to each moment, not focused on what the future will bring, but on how our gifts may be used to bring life in the present. And now in silence, let us pray for the earth and its people, for particular people, places and situations known to us where comfort, justice and healing are needed. In words and in sighs too deep for human words, we pray. Amen. We continue to be the church in our gathering together, in connecting and sustaining one another, in our shared mission of love and justice. This work is sustained by the gifts of many and in gratitude we dedicate gifts given to support the mission and vision of St. Michael's and the work of the Mingari Counselling Centre. And we rededicate our lives in response to the gifts that we have received. In the gifts that are given, we express our affirmation of this congregation and our hope that this congregation will continue to be a valuable part of our lives and the life of our communities. May we be surrounded each day with a spirit of generosity and strength so that, so that we may respond to all that life brings with generosity and with strength. Amen. We name ourselves as spirit people, bearing Christ, being neighbours, honouring diversity. Let us sing together, We are your people, Spirit of Grace.
Most of us will remain home this week. Some of us will be sent out into the world and we will return home. May our homes be a place of blessing. May the blessing of the sacred made known in Jesus, who made his name at home in Nazareth, who by his life with friends and strangers bless the life of many homes, bless your home and your life, and the homes and lives of all people and creatures, and the life of planet Earth, our only home. Amen.